So today's lesson, we're going to be talking about motivation. We're going to talk about emotions and we're going to talk about stress and how it fits into both of those concepts. Okay. Um, so with emotion, what are they? Why do we have emotions? What do you think? What, what function, if you think about survival uh, means, what, what function of survival does, do emotions have? What do you think? What are some emotions that we experience? Sadness, um, happiness. Um, okay. Excitement. Um, okay. Yeah. Let, let me uh, let me share my fear screen. Fear. Okay. Let let me write some of these down here. Screen. All right, so you said, uh, so um, emotions that we have. Oops. Let me try this again. All right, so you said emotions that we have, sadness, right? Fear, excitement, what else? Is this showing up on, this isn't showing up on the screen. I apologize. I don't know why this isn't coming up. Are, are you seeing my, what I'm writing down? No, we see just, it's kind of blurry. Okay. Yeah. Zoom or something. Yeah. Okay. So it stops you. Okay. Screen broadcast. Start broadcast. All right. See if I can get this. All right. Things are moving not so fast today. All right. Yep. Huh. Okay. All right. So excitement. What are what are some other emotions we experience? Think think of the movie Inside Out. Like How anger, many disgust. Anger, disgust, good, good. Okay, what else? Think of the movie Inside Out. Joy. Joy, that's another one, yep. So I think we covered all those. We have sadness, we have uh, fear, we have anger, disgust, and joy, right? Those are, are the five that they show in the movie. Um, However, I don't know what's going on with my, I apologize. I'm just gonna get out of, out of the, all right, leave meeting. All right, get rid of that. All right, so anyway, um, so we have those emotions. So what, what is the function of emotion? Why do we experience anger? What are some reasons why we experience anger and what does it serve? What function does it serve for us? React to um, maybe a situation or a person. In what way? What 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 is? Uh, why would we need to react in anger? By defending ourselves or defending someone that we care okay. for, or um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. We look at anger as a call to action. So if something is not right, or we feel slighted, or we feel that we're about to be harmed or or taken advantage of. Um, or stolen from, we act out in anger. And the reason why we act out in anger is because we need to protect whatever resources we have or whatever uh, we feel we're being threatened against. So anger is a call to action. What about fear? What is the, the 
response fear? Why, why do we have it? And what function does that serve for survival? So like if there's a bear, we don't go like running towards the bear. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think we've used this example before in, in the class when we, uh, if we're walking in the woods in central Pennsylvania somewhere and we encounter a black bear, you know, why, what happens to us? We get uh, this heightened sense, this physiological uh, response to either flee or fight off that bear. Most people will, will freeze or flee. Not many people will go and try and beat up a bear because they're much more gnarly and bigger and, and heavier and, and all sorts of nasty things that could probably harm us, right? So not many people would fight off a bear unless it was uh, necessary for survival. So anyway, our body responds to that automatically because we need to do something. We feel that discomfort because we need to, to act on that and do something. How about disgust? What, what do you think disgust, what function does that serve in survival? Uh, poison control in a way. Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% correct on that. Yep. So if, if something is, it, it, it smells pugnant or um, if, if it's, uh, uh, or pungent, sorry, um, or if, it, if something tastes bad, right? We have an automatic response for that. We cringe, you know, we, we kind of furrow our brow and our nose, you know, we do a lot with our nose because we associate nose and taste, uh, smell and taste with our nose. Um, so we may crinkle our nose to try and guard from smelling or tasting something. Um, so yeah, that serves a function as uh, that we don't want to ingest or, or be near something that, that is potentially toxic or um, deadly to us, right? And harmful in some way. So anyway, we, we have all these responses for, for various reasons. Now, unfortunately, we focus on a lot of the bad emotions, the bad, because those are the most readily available. Now, not many people find it, um, find it intriguing that somebody is just operating normally, right? They're operating as, as if they're happy, as if they're joyed, right? Um, so anyway, we tend to study happiness and joy a lot less over the, over the history of psychology than we have with anger, fear, disgust, right? And sadness, because those are the ones that get noticed. Those are the ones that prolonged experience can lead to bad things, you know, bad mental health, um, poor mental hygiene, and even physical health at, at some point, right? So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today, emotions and, um, and motivation. Okay. So let me, uh, let me share my screen with you so we can share some of these graphics together. And as promised, you know, emotion and motivation, right? So what is motivation? What, what are some examples of things that you're motivated to doing? Who's got some examples of things that you're motivated to do? What motivates you? To be the best person I'm capable of of, of being be the best person you can be okay mm -hmm. okay that uh well, that might be something that motivates uh people to, to do things family i see madison put on here to make decisions on situations you're in oh, oh i'm sorry i think that was regarding emotions right so um uh, yeah family might motivate somebody having a family or keeping a family keeping those relationships might be motivation what are some other things you motivated to doing Oh, I got a live crew today. <laughs> what are you, what? My, uh, my um, finish, finish at hack and then start um, a four-year college. Okay. Mm -hmm. So going to college, it takes a little bit of motivation, not mm -hmm. just a little bit. It takes a lot of motivation, right? Um, so what, there are some different reasons, and we'll talk about those, those reasons as to why we go to college. And, and pursue those things. But um, you know, many of you have different reasons. Some of you do it because uh, it, maybe you're getting good refund checks and you figure why not improve your life, right? Some people are motivated doing that. I was motivated to go to college because uh, I saw the value in having a, a career beyond a high school diploma. Um, some, uh, I think probably many of you see that value as well. Some of you want to be better, um, like, higher educated in your family, be the first to go to college, set a precedence for your kids, set an example, show leadership, 
develop skills, you know, whatever your reasons are, you're all motivated to, to go into college or getting a job for, for whatever those reasons are. And then we'll uncover, you know, what some of those motivational reasons, you know, whether they're extrinsic, whether it's monetary or it's extrinsic or intrinsic, like Ann said earlier, um, because we want to be the best person, the best version of the person that we can be. So motivation, your book describes motivation as the process by which activities are started, directed, continued uh, to meet or continued to meet physical or psychological needs. Important keyword there, physical or psychological needs, okay? Because a lot of what we do satisfies us physically. We have three things, you know, well, we have several things that, that uh, uh, we have physiological needs for. We have a need for sleep. We have a need for food and water, and we have a need for procreation or sexual, uh, sexual pro uh, procreation to advance our species, okay? Uh, most people, right? Um, and you gotta think, uh, look at those in terms of genetics. Like if we don't have that component that motivates us to, uh, uh, to procreate, to carry on our species, carry on our bloodline, then we don't. And whatever genes we have, uh, uh, they don't get passed on. They don't uh, translate to offspring and, and the next generation of us. So whatever genes we have, whatever characteristics, whether it's blue eyes, blue hair, uh, dark skin, uh, what, uh, uh, the ability to ward off, uh, you know, to have a good physique, to ward off danger, those genes go away, okay? And they don't get passed on to future generations. So anyway, that, I just want to highlight that, that, that uh, physical motivation is there um, to, to satisfy those needs. So as we talked about defining motivation, we have intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is acting, uh, is the act itself is motivating or internally rewarding, whereas extrinsic, the outcome is separate from the person. So let's kind of backpedal a little bit back in the day when we were talking about learning, operant conditioning specifically. We had a system of rewards or punishment, right? Those are extrinsic motivators. So what are some things? So let's use the college example. What are some extrinsic reasons why somebody would go to college? What are some outcomes that are outside that person that are motivating them to go to college? Their family or friends. Okay. So family or friends kind of pressuring you to do that? Maybe. Those might be extrinsic. What are some other extrinsic motivators? Financially. Finances, money, De Niro, dinghy, you know, whatever you want to call it. Money is an extrinsic motivator, right? Because we've associated money with what? In survival, with the ability to get food, get shelter, have security, right? And we'll talk about um, uh, humanistic po uh, perspectives point of view um, a little bit later with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But extrinsic motivation are things that are uh, that we're not internally driven to do. So intrinsic motivation, for example, um, how many of you enjoy reading? Truly enjoy reading? I do. Okay. I do. How, how many of you don't like reading? It's okay if you don't. I don't. I don't find it enjoyable, uh, especially uh, nonfiction. Or, I'm sorry, fiction. I don't do well with fiction novels. Um, however, science ones, I'm more intrinsically motivated to pick up and read because I want to. Um, so what is a tendency in, in grade school? Many, many of you have probably gone through grade school and you're what? You're rewarded to read, right? So many books you got a gift certificate to Pizza Hut, or you got your name up on the wall, you got to pick from the treasure chest. So you were extrinsically motivated to reading. Now, the danger in that is it might take away from the internal rewards that somebody might gain from reading, learning uh, in and of itself, right? So some things to, to kind of keep in mind when we're, tra when we're teaching our youth. So some early approaches to understanding motivation is that instinct approaches propose that some human actions may be motivated by instinct, which are innate patterns of behavior found in both people and animals, okay? For example, feeding. We all are motivated to feeding, right? 
babies come out of, of the mother's womb with a, a suckling reaction, right? They, are, they, they seek out of their mother's breast and try to feed. That is instinct. They're not trained. There's nothing about that that they learn to do. They may learn the steps to maybe crying and, and uh, letting the mother know that they're displeased so that they can, because they have hunger pangs, right? Their, their stomachs are contracting and, and they're hungry. So um, that's an uncomfortable experience and they learn to cry. And at some point they know that crying, if they start to cry, then that would result in feeding. So we, we have these instincts about us that, that come out automatically. So for example, when you hear a crash of thunder or a crash of a cymbal, that somebody, uh, that jerk that's behind you with the cymbals and just smashes it to try and scare you. Um, people react a certain way because that's instinct. We're designed to duck out of harm's way when something loud and, and fearful is present, okay? So th that's what we mean by instinct, they're biological reactions. Within that, um, we look at drive reduction theory. There are a couple of theories that explain why we do what we do and when we do it. And one of those is, <coughs> excuse me, drive reduction theory. So drive reduction theory states that if there's a need, we are driven to perform a certain action to reduce whatever it is that's making us uncomfortable. So for example, we talked about a baby uh, seeking out the, the mother's breast for, for feeding. There's a need, there's a biological need for that. If, uh, the baby's thirsty or, and or hungry. Uh, so the drive leads to this tension and arousal to get worked up and seek out whatever behaviors the baby needs to do to reduce that, uh, that tension, that, that feeling of discomfort. And we think about that with, uh, with, in terms of stress, don't we? So how many of you, when you're in a stressful situation, you wanna get out of it? How many of you do that? I do. How many of you don't want to be stressed out? Yeah, I do. You don't wanna be, you, you do or you don't wanna be stressed out? No, I don't wanna be. Why not? Why don't we wanna be stressed? It's just, uh, it's easier not to be. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, uh, it's chaotic and unsure of yourself and yeah. Yeah, stress is not comforting. Stress doesn't feel good. It, it raises our heart rate. It makes us lose sleep, but uh, we feel the tension in our necks. You know, sometimes we have shallow breathing. Our stomach isn't right. Our digestive tract isn't right. Our blood pressure goes up. All these unfortunate and, and uh, uncomfortable feelings occur when we experience anxiety and stress. So therefore we have a drive to reduce it by whatever uh, means necessary. Some people might avoid stress, right? Some people might use medication or even worse, some people might abuse substances in order to reduce whatever that discomfort is. Um, so that's drive reduction theory that, that talks about that. Now they're the opposite of that. So, um, is it good to always avoid stress, do you think? No. Why not? Because certain situations, stress could help. Um, like if you're the, the gut feeling of stress about something that might end up making you not go and then later finding out something happened there that you didn't want to be a part of. Absolutely. Okay. So um, if, if you can imagine yourself living in a bubble and never experiencing stress your entire life, what would your life look like? Do you think? Where would you be? Like anytime that you experience any kind of stressful situation, look back on your life and calculate how many times you've been stressed and you avoided every single one of those. Where would you be? Do you think? We would never learn how to cope with stress, so we wouldn't, um, yeah. yeah. We, we probably wouldn't have made it out of kindergarten, right? Because that's <laughs> stressful, right? You think about that. I mean, that's like the first thing that, uh, that, that you have to deal with with public stress is separation from your, your caregiver, from your, your mom or your dad or, or parents or whatever, grandparents, whatever. 
Um, so yeah, anytime that we've dealt with stress and we avoided it, we, pro we wouldn't have advanced, okay? So we recognize that. And, and many of us have learned to adapt to stress and just understand that stress is just part of our lives. And if, uh, the quicker we get over it and, and, and work our way through it, the more we can, the quicker we can move on to better things. So anyway, that's a, it, kind of a sidebar conversation with drive reduction theory. Um, so some of the primary and uh, acquired drives, we look at the primary drives in food, in, in, involve the body, the physiological needs that we have. So food, water, procreation, you know, those are, and sleep. Um, uh, so those are our primary drives because they make us feel uncomfortable until, and it, that pain continues until we satisfy that in some way, right? Those urges. Um, so acquired drives, we learn, they have an example here as money. Acquired drives we learn through experience. So we know that money buys things such as food, you know, pay the water bill uh, or buy your Dasani water or whatever. And unfortunately for, for some nefarious uh, folks, they understand that money can buy sex too, right? So money equate, we've equated money to many things that we need biologically. And therefore many of us try to acquire money in lieu uh, and, and with the understanding that we can at later buy the things that we are, are driven to do, okay? So let's talk about homeostasis. Homeostasis is an idea that uh, we are balanced in some way. And I always look at homeostasis as a thermostat in your house. What does the thermostat do in your home? What is, what is the science? Go ahead. Controls the temperature of the house. It adjusts the temperature of the house, right? So um, how many of you have one of those smart thermostats um, that it'll kick on the AC or it'll kick on the heat depending on how hot or how cold it goes on. It does both. Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay. So that's exactly what our bodies are designed. And you think about that. I, I don't know if we have a, uh, we don't have a, I don't have a graphic. I should put a graphic in here. So within that, if you think about, say we set our temperatures in our house from 67 degrees to 73 degrees, okay? That's our range that we want our, our house to always be at, okay? Our bodies are like that. We have, uh, we have our, our drive for hunger is similar to that. We have um, glucose that drives when we should eat or when we want to eat and when we don't want to eat, right? Or when we're satiated and full. So based on that, we have this range that glucose falls within. When it starts to get to the lower side of things, like 68 degrees, we start, our, our bodies start to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting kind of hungry here. And then when we get to 67 degrees, we know, hey, we got to do something. We got to go over to the, the food courts or we got to go make a sandwich or stir some soup or bug our mom to make us something if you're, if you're living with mom. Um, so uh, anyway, we have that drive to perform at 67, you know, at 67 degrees when our glucose levels get that low. When we start feeding, we see the sway effect and we get up to, you know, 72 degrees and our body tells us, hey, you now we're getting to about where we need to. We can probably stop thinking about food right now. And then, of course, 73 degrees, our body's saying, hey, we're full. We need to unbutton our pants a little bit just to breathe a little bit, right? Get some room, um, but stop eating. We have that, that thermostat telling us stop eating. So that's what homeostasis is, is finding that, that center balance somewhere in there. Um, and it kicks, drive kicks in when we need to, and it stops when we're satiated, okay? All right, so um, one of the other psychological needs that we start experiencing, and this becomes more of a social need, um, we look at it from a psychological perspective, but we have a need for affiliation and social interaction, and we also have a need for power. Uh, to control our lives or control the, in some cases, uh, our surrounding and the lives of others. We also have a need for achievement, which um, many people find uh, like the, to be, we talk about intrinsic motivation, right? The desire to attain realistic and challenging goals, not because they have to, not because they're getting paid to, because they want to. They have that, that desire, that drive to be challenged every day. Okay, and that might come out of optimal arousal theory, which we'll get into in a little bit. So need for affiliation, I always find interesting because we are a social creature. We're, we're born to 
uh, interact with others. Now we learned that from an early age, right? Unlike other mammals and, or other be species on the planet, we are born to be dependent upon each other, even at birth, for many years beyond birth. Can we survive after, after we're uh, born out of our mother's womb? If we were left, if we were just dropped from, the, from our mother's womb and no care whatsoever, would we survive? No. no. Not at all, right? Because we can't walk, we can't feed, we can't forage. Um, there, there are many things that would leave us vulnerable to uh, predators, right? Um, big cats or bears, you know, we were talking about bears earlier. Um, so that need for affiliation is developed earlier on. We understand that we need other people to survive, right? Um, so people that experience some trauma later on might disagree. They might say, hey, I'm better off alone and I don't need anybody else's support. I don't want anybody else's support. I don't want to be dependent on it. So that need for affiliation may be reduced depending on that person's experience, okay? Need for power. This comes from our innate drive, our instinct to be in control of our lives, our pride, right? We all have a certain pride about us because we, if we're not proud about something, then our world doesn't make sense around us. And that can be a very scary thing for some people, right? So that need for control is to put things in organization for us so that we feel like our life is routine, like our, we have some sense of control over our destiny. And in some cases, some people even take that to the extreme and feel like they have control over their own mortality, which might be a flaw in their, their uh, sense of reality. Um, as we don't, right? Realistically, do we have control over when we, when we uh, die, when we pass away from this, this earth? Ooh. We really don't. But some people feel they have the power to control that. And in some cases, they might be right. They might be able to lower the risk, but death or illness is absolutely unavoidable, right? Um, it could be reduced, but uh, if it happens, it does happen. Um, need for achievement, desire to attain realistic goals. I think we, we talked about that. We get to a certain point where we want to better ourselves, like Ann mentioned earlier. And that would be a, the need for achievement. Okay. Um, so, so the need for achievement and personality is a view of oneself. So uh, it's, it's a balance between a view of oneself, a locus of control, and beliefs about intelligence. You know, are we able and capable of fixing something, or are we just resigned to believe that um, maybe this is outside our scope of control, right? Which kind of focuses, is the focus of locus of control. Is it internal? Now, let me ask you, how many of you have taken, taken a quiz or a test and you didn't do well on the test? What was your explanation? Who did you blame for not doing well on the test? The teacher. Teacher. What, what sort of things do you say about the teacher? <laughs> uh, maybe they didn't instruct us. Um appropriately i don't know i guess okay hopefully you don't say that about me hopefully no, my no. <laughs> okay <laughs> um uh so so when we don't do well and this kind of goes back to our pride when we don't do well we blame externally right we we call it bad luck we call it somebody is against us right somebody is always against us if we don't do well if we do well what do we tend to do now, what do we tend to attribute our success to? Ourselves, right? Yeah. Maybe we studied hard enough. Maybe we put in, uh, forth an effort. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the theory behind locus of control is where do we see within our scope of control, right? And of course, view of oneself, uh, beliefs about one's abilities, and that ties in beliefs about one's intelligence, okay? Um, all right, arousal and an incentive approach. So arousal theory, uh, similar to what I, I talked about earlier, a person has an optimal level of arousal to maintain. So how many of you, especially over COVID, experienced cabin fever? What did that look like? Yeah, what, I led up, what, what led up to that and what did that look like for you? Just seeing the same people over and over and... Um... I was just very thankful and grateful that I worked through COVID because I would have 
really gone crazy. <laughs> okay. So you actually got out of the house to work for COVID? Uh, through yeah. COVID? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. If you don't mind me asking, what, what did you do? Uh, I worked at a residential treatment facility for over three years for oh my gosh. With, uh, mental health issues. Oh, man. Yeah, I worked at an RTF. So yeah, you probably know about that. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, that is uh, my, my hat's off to you. What, what, a, what a terrible situation that was for not only the workers, but the residents. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did a lot of uh, counseling work for some, some um, nurses, like group therapy via Zoom, because obviously they couldn't see anybody outside of the nursing home other than their families, and I wasn't allowed in there. So yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to help people through that process. But yeah, um, so for, for many of us, though, we wound up pretty stagnant. Like how many of you got cabin fever and you just wanted to go out and do something no matter what it was? right? That's arousal theory that uh, we have an optimal level of arousal where we tend to get bored and we need to do something. So we seek out stressful situations, just enough, right? We just do enough stress to regulate it, right? To make sure it's maintained and regulated. Sometimes it gets out of control, but for the most part, we can return back to that safety of, of uh, boredom and, and mundane lifestyle if, that, if we choose to, right? We always have that within our scope. So that explains what optimal arousal theory is, is just that, uh, that, that, that boredom that we tend to feel and we want to achieve something, we want to challenge ourselves. So we go out and we seek out situations that, uh, that do so, okay? And oftentimes they're motivated. We use the motivation of being able to um, achieve something in some way, either money or education or whatever, right? All right, uh, and some cool little graphics that, uh, you know, for some reason, this young person here wants to go from sleeping to uh, dancing. You know, that, that would be her optimal, optimal level of arousal there, is going out dancing or sleeping. I know some people that kind of fit that mold too. They don't do much, they, they sleep all day and then they go out and dancing all night, right? All right, maybe you know somebody like that as well. So anyway, arousal and performance, uh, we know that uh, very easy tasks, we have a higher arousal level because we know that we can do that. We have the belief that we're able to, we're competent, we're controlling of that situation. However, more difficult tasks that we're expected to perform higher on, uh, we may be a little bit more cautious. If you remember back to that safety mechanism where we want to go back to an area that we can control, right? So higher, more difficult tasks that require more brain energy and physicality might be shied away from. We're not going to be nearly as aroused by them because we're worried about the level of stress it might endure on us, right? So therefore, uh, arousal level isn't nearly as, as high. Um, then you might know somebody who's always sensation seeking, right? They're always looking for, for more arousal than, than the average person. Those could be your people that like to go skydiving or bungee jumping or cliff climbing, right? How many of you know somebody like that? Or maybe you're somebody like that yourself. How many of you go out of your way to find something that's exciting? Or you know somebody that does. And what does that look like? My uncle. Your uncle. What does your uncle do? He's done uh, over 10,000 skydiving jumps. He's done over 10,000 skydiving. Oh, uh, 10,000? Did yeah. I hear that correctly? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Sorry. No, it's actually probably about like six now, but yeah, sorry. It is like six, but still. Yeah. 6,000? Yeah, yeah. And how old is your uncle? Yeah, 70. Okay, so he's had some time to work on this because I'm yeah. trying to think of the mechanics. That is almost yeah. every day for check my math on this every single day for 30 years <laughs> so, <laughs> he right. started uh he started a long time ago yeah okay okay and uh, so did he did he was he like a uh, 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 what do they call it skydive master or something like that where they can yeah they they jump tandem with people mm -hmm, something like okay. that hey he's actually uh trying to break the world record for 60 and above um like um they, they go up in the air and they do, um, they get in clumps and whatever it's called. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I've seen that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
they're trying to break the world record of how many people can like hold hands and 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 be together in the, in the air for okay I'm, I'm i'm imagining one of those motivational posters you know where they talk about teamwork and you have that pretty little design that honeycomb design where everybody yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay well that, that's really cool but yeah. wow okay well thank you for sharing that so that might be somebody that goes above and beyond and and seeks out uh, you know i in some way i'm a sensation seeker i love roller coasters I don't know what now I'm I'm oh, 45 years old and and just going out and hanging out on in uh, theme parks not waiting in line that's probably the worst part but again kind of enduring that stress standing in that summer heat for hours at a time just to get a two minute ride on a roller coaster right how crazy is that some people do that right um, some people have incentives right they have an incentive approach to uh, getting people to do things so. Incentives are things that lure people to action. As you see here, we got a hundred dollar bill. How many of you wouldn't do just about anything somebody would ask you to do for a hundred dollar bill? Just about. I'm not saying you do anything, but let's face it: if somebody asks you to eat something gnarly and nasty for a hundred dollar bill, you might consider it, right? So those are incentives, and incentives can take on many forms. They could take on uh, promotions. We can uh, see promotions as being an incentive. Um, Need for affiliation, right? Some people would dangle that out there. You want to be part of this group, this in-group that we have the secret handshake and all these benefits to being in this group. You got to do this. You know, some people use initiation in order to get in that group. Some people ask you to pay a certain amount of money to get into that group or whatever. So anyway, you have incentives to, to help uh, motivate people. Um, you have the incentive approach. Um, Oh, I already talked about to, to reward um, rewards of external um, stimulus. Uh, expectancy value theories are the beliefs and values of what you feel is important. So if you feel strongly that murder is wrong or, or violence is wrong, money might not be a, a, an incentive that works for that person, right? Or works for you. So um, you're always balancing that. What incentive does it take to overcome whatever values you believe, right? All right, so we talked a little bit uh, earlier about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Abraham Maslow, right around the middle of the, the 19th century, I'm sorry, 20th century, 1900s, um, uh, Abraham Maslow started looking at um, not uh, looking opposite of existential psychology. So. Uh, determinism. Well, you know, we're we're determined. You know, uh, like for example, um, Sigmund Freud believed that all of our personality traits, all of our defense mechanisms, come because some kind of trauma uh, had some kind of negative <coughs> negative experience in our lives that we're trying to avoid. Abraham Maslow was more took a more humanistic approach and looked at it from a perspective that humans want to be the best versions of themselves, like Anne mentioned earlier, right? So we do this by imagining ourselves in the best possible situation. And some people try to do that through achieving what they call self-actualization, which is uh, really lowered physiological needs. All of our physio physiological needs have been met and our full human potential has been achieved. We're able to give back, we're able to leave a legacy, and we are highly influential, we're highly regarded, we feel loved, we feel um, uh, regarded, yeah, as, as, uh, as the highest form of enlightenment, okay? That's self-actualization. Some people, um, times when self-actualization is temporarily achieved is called peak experiences. Sometimes they're at the height. Maybe many of you can identify with that. Maybe you were at the height of your career and then something changed where you no longer did that. Maybe you wanted to do something else or you were fired from that job for, or laid off because of uh, your, your position wasn't needed anymore, right? So some people might experience peak experiences and then they come back down to having to meet their needs for affiliation, needs for love and affection or um, uh, need for or even some people might have to, like if they lose their, their position. You know, a lot of people saw that over COVID where a lot of these companies went scaling back. They loved their job. They loved what they did. They were making the great, a great amount of money. And then all of a sudden they're fighting just to keep their house, uh, uh, trying to scrounge money just to feed their families, right? 
So even though they had those moments of self-actualization, they kind of went down. And I'll, I'll explain how this looks here in just a second here. Through the hierarchy, looks like a triangle, looks like a pyramid, right? And this is what Maslow proposed is that we try to meet our greatest need, which is our physiological needs first, satisfy our hunger, thirst, and fatigue, right? Um, once those are met, we then try to, uh, then we strive to meet our safety needs, feel secure, safe, out of danger, right? Have our homes, have our security alarms if, if that's what makes you feel safe. Um, you know, kind of one of the things I, I developed over the years, <clears throat> I love to camp. I really enjoy camping. And um, lately, you know, I used to go tent camping all the time, didn't think about it, slept like a log. And um, I don't know what it is, but something shifted recently where I prefer to sleep in a camper because I don't want to worry about critters. I don't want to worry about sto uh, storing my food away. So my safety needs to make me feel more secure for some reason is a hard shell camper. Now uh, might be some kind of disillusion of some sort, but nonetheless, um, that, that was me meeting my safety needs, right? After we meet our safety needs and our physiological needs, then we start to move up the ladder, move up the pyramid to start satisfying what we call our uh, psychological needs, okay? So our psychological needs are belongingness and love, right? We all tend to want that need for affiliation. We want to join others and, and coexist with others so that we can maybe procreate or have that sense of belonging or whatever those motivations are. We have a, a sense we want to be loved and, and belong to some kind of group. After that's met, we go move up the chain to self-esteem needs, right? To achieve or be competent gain approval and recognition, right? Because we already feel like we belong to a group. We already feel like we're adored or we're in a relationship that's healthy. So next thing we want to do is we want to stay in that. And, and we feel more secure if we have those esteem needs because that branches us out. If we lose that relationship or we lose that group, we can gain another one because we feel competent to do so, right? Once our, our esteem needs are met, then we uh, start working on our cognitive needs. Right, so think of this as like a skilled labor. So somebody that, uh, that, that wants to be competent as a skilled labor, they're meeting their esteem needs. Once they're doing that every day, maybe they wanna move up the, the ladder, you know, they wanna get into management or something. They're gonna start exploring other realms of outside of that, that skill, um, uh, the skills that they've acquired and they got proficient. So they may want to know more. They wanna understand what management is like and they move up through cog uh, cognitive needs. Um, after cognitive needs, we have aesthetic needs, which is the uh, need to appreciate beauty, order, and symmetry. And then last but not least, we have self-actualization, which is the self-fulfillment and realize your own potential, okay? Now, one thing to note um, on, on self-actualization, one of the flaws in Maslow's hierarchy of needs is it's very hard to quantify many of these levels, but more importantly, it's hard to quantify or be able to describe what self-actualization actually looks like. Many people might just feel, hey, I've made it, right? But yet they go on to achieve greater things or more uh, higher levels of things, right? So maybe somebody's dream was to be the owner of a business one day and they get into that business and they say, yay, I made it, you know, I'm self-actualized. I think this is great. This is where I wanted to be all my life is to own this business. And then they realize, well, hey, maybe I want to branch out. Maybe I want to be the, the, the president of a, of a franchise or something. So they keep building, right? So self-actualization is one of those tricky things where is it something that we feel uh, that we know that we've arrived or is it by evaluation of other people that they've achieved that? And that could be hard because we don't know necessarily what's going on in somebody's head or somebody's mind, right? Um, so self-determination theory is another way to look at this. It's defined, uh, it defines uh, stress and stressors and describe two methods for coping with stress. So uh, SDT or self-determination theory is the social context of action has, effect, has an effect on the type of motivation. So with autonomy, 
um, you have autonomy, oh, sorry. You have autonomy, you have competence, and you have relatedness, right? So how close are we with relatedness? How close are we to being able to achieve whatever that goal is, right? What is our competence? Are we able to, to achieve that goal? And autonomy, can we do it by ourselves? That's all explained in self-determination theory, okay? Um, all right, so I'm going to take a break here. Let's see, let me see how long, because I, I kind of described hunger already, so I, I don't want to, I'm gonna kind of speed through this. So what I wanna do is uh, share with you a video, okay? Because we're, we're not gonna have time. I wanna cover emotion next time, and I don't think I'll be able to do that without showing this video. So let me pull up this video for you. All right, any questions on, on motivation? So the video I'm about to show you is, uh, it's a guy named Dan Pink. And Dan Pink is, uh, he, he's actually a lawyer, but he speaks a lot on, on business solutions and motivation and the psychology of how business occurs. And what he talks about in, in this video I'm about to show you is motivation, because we tend to have things a little bit wrong um, in, in our business models, in many business models that uh, people are using. So what he talks about is, is how other countries are doing things and how some of these innovative companies are looking to see that motivation isn't always incentivized, right? It's not always purposeful. It's not something that we can elicit. Like, for example, how many of you really, if you had the opportunity to, to make money and not go to work, how many of you would do that? I would. Is there anybody that wouldn't? Is there anybody that, that if you were given all the money that you needed to survive, would you still go to work? How many of you would still go to work? I think I would make my own schedule, but <clears throat> I... Okay. I need something to do during the day. I can't just be like, I'm going to travel and eat and do whatever I want the rest of my life. You know? I need, okay. Okay. I need some purpose. <laughs> so, so you would find a balance somewhere in there that you would have, yeah. you know, you, you have the money, but you want to also have that purpose, right? Well, that's what he kind of alludes to here is, is people having that intrinsic motivation, that purpose, that drive to do what they want to do, but they know that they're, that they're set. I know that sounds, you know, he calls it, uh, it sound, he says it sounds like it's utopic, um, but uh, the, there, there's a lot of science that supports that you give somebody enough leeway and make sure that their basic needs are met and they're going to want to uh, develop that drive to be better, okay? So anyway, let me, without further ado, let me play this video, get through the, Uh, All right. Sorry. Can you all hear it all right? Yep. Okay, I need to make a confession at the outset here. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did something that I regret, something that I'm not particularly proud of, uh, something that in many ways I wish no one would ever know, but that here I feel kind of obliged to reveal. Um, <laughs> In the late 1980s, in a moment of youthful indiscretion, I went to law school. <laughs> now, um, in America, law is a professional degree. You get your university degree, then you go on to law school. And when I got to law school, I didn't do very well. To put it mildly, I didn't do very well. 
I, in fact, graduated in the part of my law school class that made the top 90% possible. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I never practiced law a day in my life. I pretty much wasn't allowed to. Um, <laughs> but today, against my better judgment, against the advice of my own wife, um, I want to try to dust off some of those legal skills, what's left of those legal skills. I don't want to tell you a story. I want to make a case. I want to make a hard-headed, evidence-based, dare I say lawyerly case for rethinking how we run our businesses. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, take a look at this. This is called the candle problem. Some of you might have seen this before. It was created in 1945 by a psychologist named Carl Dunker. Carl Dunker created this experiment that's used in a whole variety of experiments in behavioral science. And here's how it works. Suppose I'm the experimenter. I bring you into a room. I give you a candle, some thumbtacks, and some matches. And I say to you, your job is to attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Now, what would you do? Many people begin trying to thumbtack the candle to the wall. Doesn't work. Somebody, some people, and I saw somebody kind of make the motion over here, some people have a great idea where they light the match, melt the side of the candle, try to adhere it to the wall. It's an awesome idea. Doesn't work. And eventually, after five or 10 minutes, most people figure out the solution, which you can see here. The key is to overcome what's called functional fixedness. You look at that box and you see it only as a receptacle for the tax, but it can also have this other function as a platform for the candle, the candle problem. Now, I want to tell you about an experiment using the candle problem done by a scientist named Sam Glucksberg, who's now at Princeton University in the US. This shows the power of incentives. Here's what he did. He gathered his participants and he said, I'm going to time you how quickly you can solve this problem. To one group, he said, I'm going to time you to establish norms, averages, for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. If you're the fastest of everyone we're testing here today, you get $20. Okay, now this is several years ago, adjusted for inflation. It's a decent sum of money for a few minutes of work. Okay, it's a nice motivator. Question, how much faster did this group solve the problem? Answer, it took them on average three and a half minutes longer. Three and a half minutes longer. Now this makes no sense, right? I mean, I'm, I'm an American, I believe in free markets, that's not how it's supposed to work, right? <laughs> if you want people to perform better, you reward them, right? Bonuses, commissions, their own reality show, incentivize them. That's how business works. But that's not happening here. You've got an incentive designed to sharpen thinking and, and accelerate creativity, and it does just the opposite. It dulls thinking and blocks creativity. And what's interesting about this experiment is that it's not an aberration. This has been replicated over and over and over again for nearly 40 years years. These contingent motivators. If you do this, then you get that. Work in some circumstances, but for a lot of tasks, they actually either don't work or often they do harm. This is one of the most robust findings in social science and also one of the most ignored. I spent the last couple of years looking at the science of human motivation, particularly the dynamics of extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators. And I'm telling you, it's not even close. If you look at the science, there is a mismatch between what science knows and what business does. And what's alarming here is that our business operating system, think of the set of assumptions and protocols beneath our businesses, how we motivate people, how we apply our, our human resources. It's built entirely around these extrinsic motivators, around carrots and sticks. That's actually fine for many kinds of 20th century tasks. But for 21st century tasks, that mechanistic reward and punishment approach doesn't work, often doesn't work, and often does harm.
Let me show you what I mean. So Glucksberg did another experiment similar to this, where he presented the problem in a slightly different way, like this up here. Okay? Attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Same deal. You were timing for norms. You were incentivizing. What happened this time? This time, the incentivized group kicked the other group's butt. Why? Because when the tax are out of the box, it's pretty easy, isn't it? <laughs> if then rewards work really well for those sorts of tasks, where there's a simple set of rules and a clear destination to go to. Rewards, by their very nature, narrow our focus, concentrate the mind. That's why they work in so many cases. And so for tasks like this, a narrowed focus, where you just see the goal right there, zoom straight ahead to it, they work really well. But for the real candle problem, you don't want to be looking like this. The solution's not over here. The solution's on the periphery. You want to be looking around. That, re that reward actually narrows our focus and restricts our possibility. Let me tell you why this is so important. In Western Europe, in many parts of Asia, in North America, in Australia, white-collar workers are doing less of this kind of work and more of this kind of work. That routine, rule-based, left-brain work, certain kinds of accounting, certain kinds of financial analysis, certain kinds of computer programming has become fairly easy to outsource, fairly easy to automate. Software can do it faster. Low-cost providers around the world can do it cheaper. So what really matters are the more right-brain, creative, conceptual kinds of abilities. Think about your own work. Think about your own work. Are the problems that you face, or even the problems we've been talking about here, are those kinds of problems where they have a clear set of rules and a single solution? No. The rules are mystifying. The solution, if it exists at all, is surprising and non-obvious. Everybody in this room is dealing with their own version of the candle problem. And for candle problems of any kind, in any field, those if-then rewards, the things around which we've built so many of our businesses don't work. Now, I mean, it makes me crazy. And this is not, here's the thing, this is not a feeling, okay? I'm a lawyer, I don't believe in feelings. This is not a philosophy. I'm an American, I don't believe in philosophy. <laughs> this is a fact, or as we say in my hometown of Washington, D.C., a true fact. <laughs> Let me... <laughs> Let me give you an example of what I mean. Let me marshal the evidence here, because I'm not telling you a story, I'm making a case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, some evidence. Dan O'Reilly, one of the great economists of our time. He and three colleagues did a study of some MIT students. They gave these MIT students a bunch of games, games that involved creativity and motor skills and concentration. And they offered them for, for performance three levels of rewards. Small reward, medium reward, large reward. Okay? Do really well, you get the large reward on down. What happened? As long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the performance. Okay? But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Then they said, okay, let's see if there's any cultural bias here. Let's go to Madurai, India and test this. Reward standard of living is lower in, in Madurai. A reward that's modest by North American standards is more meaningful there. Same deal. A bunch of games, three levels of rewards. What happens? People offered the medium level of rewards, did no better than people offered the small rewards. But this time, people offered the highest rewards. They did worst of all. In eight of the nine tasks we examined across three experiments, higher incentives led to worse performance. Is this some kind of touchy-feely socialist conspiracy going on here? <laughs> no, these are economists from MIT, from Carnegie Mellon, from the University of Chicago. And do you know who sponsored this research? 
the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. That's the American experience. Let's go across the pond to the London School of Economics. LSE, London School of Economics, alma mater of 11 Nobel laureates in economics. Training ground for great economic thinkers like George Soros and Friedrich Hayek and Mick Jagger. Last <laughs> month, just last month, economists at LSE looked at, at 51 studies of pay for performance plans inside of companies. Here's what the economists there said. We find that financial incentives can result in a negative impact on overall performance. There's a mismatch between what science knows and what business does. And what worries me as we stand here in the rubble of the economic collapse is that too many organizations are making their decisions, their, their, their policies about talent and people based on assumptions that are outdated, unexamined, and rooted more in folklore than in science. And if we really want to get out of this economic mess, and if we really want high performance on those definitional tasks of the 21st century, the solution is not to do more of the wrong things, to entice people with a sweeter carrot or threaten them with a sharper stick. We need a whole new approach. The good news about all this is that the scientists who've been studying motivation have given us this new approach. It's an approach built much more around intrinsic motivation, around the desire to do things because they matter, because we like it, because they're interesting, because they're part of something important. And to my mind, that new operating system for our businesses revolves around three elements, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, the urge to direct our own lives, mastery, the desire to get better and better at something that matters, and purpose, the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. These are the building blocks of an entirely new operating system for our businesses. I want to talk today only about autonomy. In the 20th century, we came up with this idea of management. Management did not emanate from nature. Okay? Management is an in, it's, it's, like, it's not a tree, it's a television set. Okay? Somebody invented it. And it doesn't mean it's going to work forever. Management is great. Traditional notions of management are great if you want compliance. But if you want engagement, self-direction works better. Let me give you some examples of some kind of radical notions of, of self-direction. Um, and what this means, you, see, you, see, you don't see a lot of it, but you see the first stirrings of something really interesting going on. Because what it means is it means paying people adequately and fairly, absolutely. Getting the issue of money off the table and then giving people lots of autonomy. Let me give you some examples. How many of you have heard of the company Atlassian? Okay, looks like less than half. Um, <laughs> Atlassian is an Australian software company, and they do something incredibly cool. A few times a year, they tell their engineers, go for the next 24 hours and work on anything you want as long as it's not part of your regular job. Work on anything you want. So the engineers use this time to come up with a cool uh, patch of code, come up with an elegant hack. Then they present all of the stuff that they've developed to their uh, teammates, to the rest of the company, in this wild and woolly all-hands meeting at the end of the day. And then, being Australians, everybody has a beer. They call them FedEx days. Why? Because you have to deliver something overnight. It's pretty, it's not bad. It's a, it's a huge trademark violation, but it's pretty clever. Um, <laughs> that one day of intense autonomy has produced a whole array of software fixes that might never have existed. And it's worked so well that Atlassian has taken it to the next level with 20% time, done famously at Google, where engineers can work, spend 20% of their time working on anything they want. They have autonomy over their time, their task, their team, their technique. Okay, radical amounts of autonomy. And at Google, as, most of, as many of you know, about half of the new products in a typical year are birthed during that 20% time. Things like Gmail, Orkut, Google News. Let me give you an even more radical example of it. Something called the results only work environment, the ROW, created by two American consultants in place at about a dozen companies around North America. In a row, people don't have schedules. They show up when they want. They don't have to be in the office at a certain time or any time. They just have to get their work done. How they do it, when they do it, where they do it, is totally up to them. Meetings in these kinds of environments are optional. What happens? Almost across the board, productivity goes up, 
Worker engagement goes up, uh, worker satisfaction goes up, turnover goes down. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. These are the building blocks of a new way of doing things. Now, some of you might look at this and say, hmm, that sounds nice, but it's utopian. And I say, nope, I have proof. In the mid-1990s, Microsoft started an encyclopedia called Encarta. They had deployed all the right incentives, all the right incentives. They paid professionals to write and edit thousands of articles. Well-compensated managers oversaw the whole thing to make sure it came in on budget and on time. A few years later, another encyclopedia got started. Different model, right? <laughs> Do it for fun. No one gets paid a cent or a euro or a yen. Do it because you like to do it. Now, if you had, just 10 years ago, if you had gone to an economist anywhere and said, hey, I got these two different models for creating an encyclopedia. If they went head to head, who would win? 10 years ago, you could not have found a single sober economist anywhere on planet Earth <laughs> who would have predicted the Wikipedia model. This is the titanic battle between these two approaches. This is the Ali Frazier of motivation, right? This is the thriller in Manila, all right? Intrinsic motivators versus extrinsic motivators. Uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose versus carrots and sticks, and who wins? Intrinsic motivation, autonomy, mastery, and purpose in a knockout. Let me wrap up. There's a mismatch between what science knows and what business does, and here's what science knows. One. Those 20th century rewards, those motivators we think are the natural part of business, do work, but only in a surprisingly narrow band of circumstances. Two, those if-then rewards often destroy creativity. Three, the secret to high performance isn't rewards and punishments, but that unseen intrinsic drive, the drive to do things for their own sake, the drive to do things because they matter. And here's the best part. Here's the best part. We already know this. The science confirms what we know in our hearts. So, if we repair this mismatch between what science knows and what business does, if we bring our motivation, notions of motivation, into the 21st century, if we get past this lazy, dangerous ideology of carrots and sticks, we can strengthen our businesses, we can solve a lot of those candle problems, and maybe, 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 we can change the world. I rest my case. All right, what'd you all think? And I think it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, what, did, what did it mean for you? I mean, uh, personally, on a personal level, how did it, uh, uh, what, what sort of things did you realize that maybe you're incentivized to doing things? Like for example, uh, as a teacher, I, I look at uh, student performance. The only time that I usually optimize performance with many students, not all of them, are when I incentivize through extra credit or uh, good grades or something like that. Um, but so what, what are some things that maybe if you had to pick one thing in your life that you could just do because you didn't need the incentive to do it anymore, what would that be? Crickets, huh? Did you understand the question? Yeah, I understand. We had, I think we understood the question, but okay. So, so um, think about all the things that you're incentivized to doing, like uh, participating in class, for example. How many of you would not be here if attendance wasn't taken, or if it didn't count some way uh, negatively against you, um, or doing your, maybe your, your job, your, your career, what would you do if, if incentives were taken off the table? What would you, um, what kind of thing, what sort of areas would you have improvement in? Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I just wanted to kind of leave you with a parting thought of, you know, just looking about how, how uh, we internalize things, how we turn things into intrinsic as, as opposed to extrinsic motivation. But think about how that looks in your life um, and things that you can improve upon, uh, either for yourself or for your families or your society or, or uh, just your, uh, the people around you in general, okay? All right, any questions before we depart today?